Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations in the Digital Age. The bloody civil war in Syria has spawned a humanitarian refugee crisis of dimensions unknown since World War II. Nearly 5.5 million people have fled the conflict, with only around 10,000 resettled in the United States, less than 0.2% of the total Syrian refugee population. Yet Americans have been strongly resistant to accepting more refugees with xenophobic attitudes eerily reminiscent of those towards Jews in the 1940s seeking to flee Nazi persecution. With us to discuss the refugee crisis is David Miliband, former foreign minister of the United Kingdom and president of the International Rescue Committee, a global humanitarian aid, relief and development non-governmental organization founded in 1933 at the request of Albert Einstein, which offers emergency aid and long-term assistance to refugees and those displaced by war, persecution, or natural disaster. David, we're very much honored to have Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Us. Pleased to be here. Now, are we in the midst today of a refugee crisis? Yes, we're in the midst of a refugee crisis measured by its size. 25 million refugees around the world, the 5 million from Syria as the poster child for that, but obviously long-term wars from Somalia, uh, Congo, Afghanistan, producing this extraordinary number of refugees. Uh, less than 1% of the world's refugees went home last year. So this is not just a, a spike, it's a long-term crisis. And I think that's the clue to explain that it's not just the scale of the numbers that merits the word crisis, it's also the conditions that these people are living in. 25 years in the largest refugee camp in the world in Dadaab, in uh, eastern Kenya, 100,000 people born, Somalis born in the Dadaab uh, refugee camp. Increasing numbers of refugees in urban areas. If you go to Istanbul, a thousand kilometers from the Syrian border, you'll find Syrian refugees. Ditto in Beirut, countries across, uh, cities across the world. So I think this is a crisis both in its size and in the failure of response. When you speak of these numbers of refugees, are you speaking of uh, those uh, displaced from their homes by natural disaster as well as No, these are really, I mean, the definition of a refugee is someone who has a well-founded fear of persecution or death. And it's, it's important to know that there are 25 million people who are forced to flee their homes by, uh, for political reasons, essentially, rather than economic reasons. It's also the case that there are 40 million people internally displaced. In other words, they've been displaced from their homes by conflict that haven't crossed the borders of their own home nation. Nigeria, uh, you'll know, uh, has this massive issue of Boko Haram in the northeast of the country, in the Lake Chad Basin. Two and a half million Nigerians displaced from their homes in the northeast of the country by Boko Haram. Boko and, Haram being a terrorist organization. Yeah, which, which, but which doesn't uh, register in the refugee statistics because they're not crossing the border into Niger or Chad or Cameroon, small numbers. Uh, do. And that's different from migration flows that are the result of economic poverty and uh, problems. Or natural disasters. Natural disasters. I mean, the thing about natural disasters is that all of the evidence is that people generally return. The point about a natural disaster is that if you think about most recently the, in the Philippines or the terrible earthquake in New Zealand, uh, people have the chance to go back. And that's different from a war, especially one which goes on for a generation. And the point about the modern civil wars is that they're not short term, they're long term. I mean, everyone knows that the US has now been in Afghanistan for twice the length of the Second World War. And that is not the exception, that is the rule, that these civil wars that dominate the global landscape go on for a long time and often don't have a clear end. Uh, Richard Haas suggests it might be a period of 30 years, another 30 years war. Well, the, the, the average length of time, I mean, it's a bit difficult talking averages, but 37 years is the average length of time for a civil war. And if you think about uh, Somalia, Congo, Afghanistan, you're talking multi-generational uh, conflicts. The Syria conflict has been going on for five years, five and a half years. No one wants to tell you it's going to be over soon. 
uh, South Sudan, recent conflict, uh, still ongoing, uh, albeit at a relatively low level compared to, to Syria. Uh, these, th there are fundamental failings of peacemaking and peacekeeping, but there's also the issue of what happens to people who are affected by these conflicts. And our argument as an international aid agency is that there are global responsibilities in respect of these people. Uh, those are humanitarian or moral responsibilities, but they're also strategic because humanitarian crises that are not properly addressed become political crises. You can see that in Europe at the moment. Uh, well, let's uh, focus on Syria. You have about uh, half a population of 23 million that's been displaced. And how many are, um, uh, are remain within Syria? So five million refugees. That leaves about 17 million or so inside the country. Of the 17 million, seven million are internally displaced. Internally displaced. Now, uh, what is uh, IRC doing uh, for uh, these refugees, so our, either within Syria or outside of Syria? Yeah, our, our work, first of all, is inside the war zones where we provide health care, notably, uh, where we offer some education in the north of the country, in, in uh, the east of the country. We're able to offer some cash assistance because the market economy is still going. People have been displaced. So eight of our hospitals have been bombed uh, by the Russians or by the Syrians this year. And so our people are in harm's way. They are Syrians. They're not Americans who've been shipped into Syria. These are people working inside their own communities under unspeakable duress and uh, distress. The second thing we do is we obviously work in the neighboring states, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, uh, Iraq, for the refugees who have left. And that work is to protect the women and kids, to promote employment in those countries that allow it, education, healthcare, those are the main services. How and many workers do you have, um, IRC workers do you have within Syria? We've got about 1,200 staff within Syria who are working today. One, uh, people ask me, what's the thing that you worry about most? I worry about most is the safety of, of our staff, whether in Syria or South Sudan or elsewhere. Um, and then we have another 1,000 staff or so in the neighboring states. Uh, the international aid system hasn't been able to gear up adequately. And so there's a lot of short-termism, a lot of the grants are very short-term. We're, we're living a bit hand-to-mouth. Uh, and that makes the uh, job that much tougher. And then what do you do for the, what, roughly 5 million uh, refugees who've managed to leave the country? Yeah, so there's 5 million, most of whom are in the neighboring states, Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq. That's where we do these protection services, the education, the health care, and the employment services. We're also now working in Europe. I never th I'm the first non-American to run the IRC, been doing so for three years. Little did I think we would be deploying IRC teams into Greece and Serbia back into Europe uh, for the first time in a very long time. And I think that uh, that speaks to the desperation that people felt, whether inside Syria or in the neighboring states. They've, ta they've taken their chance. Thousands have died on the way. But we work in Europe uh, as well, trying to offer some support for the refugees who arrive. Uh, the final piece of the jigsaw, obviously, is the refugee resettlement in the U.S. We, we run 29 offices around the U.S. and uh, have helped resettle some of those Syrians, as well as from other countries, who, who've arrived here over the last five years. How many um, Syrians have been resettled in the United States? Well, you gave the figure of around uh, 10,000. Uh, over the course of the five years of the war, it's a bit larger than that. We're now up to 12 or 13,000 in total, a small percentage of the total, and obviously a, a relatively small percentage of the U.S. refugee resettlement total, because uh, this year about 85,000 refugees will be resettled from around the world. Um, Syria is about 10,000, so you can immediately see that the preponderance of them come from other countries. They come from Congo, they come from Bhutan, they come from Iran, they come from, they've historically come from Cuba as well. Now you use the term resettled. Do you mean that they've been, uh, they've left their native country? Exactly. Uh, they've uh, moved to a second country, say a camp in Turkey, and then we take them uh, from there, or could it mean uh, resettled because they came directly from the... No, I mean, a refugee larger. who's resettled is, has generally been processed by the UN in one of the neighboring states um, and has then applied for to come to the US. The US authorities then do their 12 to 18 months of diligent security vetting and other um, checking, and then people are assigned to a city across the US. So during the election campaign, uh, Donald Trump, uh, speaking of the Syrian refugees, warned of a quote, a better, bigger version of the legendary Trojan horse, saying, we have to stop the tremendous flow of Syrian refugees into the United States. We don't know who they are. 
They have no documentation and we don't know what they are planning. Uh, and that's the end of quotation. Uh, now, other than the statement, we don't know what they're planning, uh, does any of uh, Trump's statements square with the facts? Well, the, the first thing to say is that these people are victims of terror and we meet them, we talk to them, and what you hear is heartbreaking human stories of people who still have relatives being either bombed by the Russians or terrorized by ISIS inside This might uh, include Syria. women and children, isn't well, it? The, the vast bulk of them are families, very few single men are uh, admitted. And I think it's important uh, to say that the work that's done means that we do know the names of these people. If they can't show who they are, if they can't show that they're going to be safe in the US or they're going to they're going to behave themselves in the US and they don't come to the US because it's the US government who chooses them and obviously it's very very important to track how does campaign rhetoric become government policy and that's the phase that we're in at the moment we obviously don't know what the government policy is going to be we're here as a non-governmental organization to lay out the facts not just the history of the US's role as a haven for people who are fleeing persecution but also as a global leader when it comes to effective refugee integration and resettlement because from Andy Grove the founder of Intel to Madeleine Albright to Sergey Brin we have in this country an extraordinary record of people becoming productive and patriotic citizens because they know the value of the freedom that the US offers and we'll obviously be engaging in a very open way with the administration and anyone else about how the system actually works. Now, you did have a goal of, uh, uh, of resettling uh, 10,000 Syrians in uh, 2017. Uh, in 2016. You, well, 2016, you, you did that. Yeah. But now in 2017, aren't, aren't you also projecting well, another, an additional 10,000? I mean, obviously, we don't know yet what the new administration is going to decide in respect of the numbers. But it's your hope that uh, the United States will uh, absorb an additional 10,000? I think Syria? it's important that the U.S. recognizes not just that refugee resettlement of all faith traditions is not just a, the right thing to do because these people are fleeing terror. It's not just a practical thing to do because the US has all this experience of how refugee resettlement works. It's also a smart thing to do because actually the US's global position in part depends on the fact that it doesn't discriminate on grounds of race or religion or color when it comes to, uh, or creed, or when it comes to coming into the US. The, the, the last thing that ISIS or anyone else wants is the US to be a successful example of a multi-faith society. Well, uh, the first uh, Trump statement was that uh, we should, uh, at least for a time, exclude all Muslims uh, from the United States for reasons, uh, I suppose, of fear of terrorism. Uh, then uh, he kind of dialed back from that position and said uh, we should have uh, extra vetting uh, for um, uh, uh, refugees from certain uh, Middle Eastern countries, but uh, none from Syria because he uh, identifies Syria with ISIS and he thinks that's how ISIS operatives will get into the United States. Uh, what is the factual basis for that? Have, have terrorists actually come here as refugees? And well, well, no. Uh, the, 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 factual, the, the facts are, obviously, first of all, ISIS is victimizing Syrians rather than uh, all Syrians supporting uh, ISIS. Secondly, the vetting process, as authenticated by successive Homeland Security Secretaries, is one that is continually kept up to date. It now uses biometric uh, testing to make sure that people are who they uh, say they are. Uh, there are checks after a year uh, before green cards are offered so that uh, the refugees are, have a process that they have to go through, never mind the process five years later when they can apply for citizenship. And the fundamental point is that the U.S. chooses which Syrians it wants to have. So it's not that Syrians have a right or anyone else has a right to come to the U.S. The U.S. can choose which refugees it wants to resettle. And there is a symbolic value as well as a substantive value. The substantive value is obviously for the individuals themselves. The symbolic value is that the U.S. sends a message to those who are bearing the greatest share of the refugee load, namely allies like Jordan, countries like Lebanon. Those are countries that have got millions of refugees. And the U.S. is saying, we're not just going to do international aid. We'll also, for the most vulnerable cases, help these people make a new start in their life. And as you said earlier, these are often widows and families who've been through the hell of a civil war that has claimed so many lives already.
Well, once uh, they get here uh, and they're resettled here, uh, what is their predicament? Does IRC continue to follow them and we, monitor we them? We meet people at the airport. We get their kids into school. We help with job training and housing support. There are limits to federal and state limits to how much benefit people are able to get. Uh, the greatest support is in the first three months. There's then another five months of, of limited support for certain uh, cases. And then uh, people, the most important thing is that people find a job. We're actually pretty successful at getting uh, communities into jobs, at least getting one member of a household into a job. And if you don't get into a job, then obviously you're really going to struggle. And so it's a, an employment-focused program in the U.S., and I think that's a successful model. It's one that the Europeans would be well advised to copy. Is uh, there a history with respect to these refugees of their remaining in the United States and becoming citizens? Or yeah, do I mean, they the, want to go back I mean, to... in the cases, I mean, Albert Einstein founded the International Rescue Committee. He was a refugee in the U.S. and he became a citizen. A rather productive one. one. Yes. A rather productive mm -hmm. one. But, but also, the Steve Jobs was the um, son of a Syrian refugee, ironically. And so do they become citizens? Yes. Are some of them extraordinarily productive? Yes. And I think it's very important to humanize this group of the global population because 65 million doesn't just sound like a large number, it is a large number. Um, they're not all coming to rich countries. Most of them are staying in poor or lower middle income countries. What they do need though is international support because they are the victims of other people's wars. What has been uh, the political impact, uh, particularly in Europe, of uh, the refugee crisis? I mean, we see uh uh, neo-Nazi groups uh, um, uh, arising uh, throughout Europe, France, Belgium, Germany, uh, and uh, we certainly see uh, many right-wing uh, politicians expressing xenophobic uh, sentiments, and we saw the uh, situation in your native country with Brexit, uh, where a lot of the uh, animus against the EU was uh, the, the fear of the refugees uh, coming into the country, taking over the country. Well, I think there's, a, first of all, a lot of confusion between refugees and immigrants. Within the European Union, there is free movement of people. And so a lot of the tension has been associated with the movement of European citizens rather than the entry of refugees from outside. But there's a lot of confusion between the two. Secondly, you're right. Uh, Europe is suffering a rise in far-right political activity. Um, everyone's thinking about the election in France next year where Mrs. Le Pen is running from a far-right platform. I think that it's also important to say that these are not majoritarian movements in European societies, yet the resilience of countries that have been through an economically very tough period in southern Europe, in Greece, in uh, Portugal, Spain, never mind in Western Europe like in Ireland, th these are not countries that are being overrun by fascist groups. But I think it's very important not to be complacent, I mean, not just because of European history, but because uh, there is a feeding on fear that is real. And there's a feeding on division and fissure in society that is real. And uh, if uh, mainstream politics doesn't provide answers, then far right politics will provide answers. And it's very important, I think, that uh, these problems are not kind of minimized or swept under the carpet, but that they're addressed uh, head on in a way that, as Mrs. Merkel has said, is in accord with European values and European history rather than at variance with it. Well, uh, Germany has actually taken on more refugees than any European country. Yeah, I think for an American audience, the, uh, the German numbers are, will be extraordinary because the American previously world leading numbers were in the 85,000 country. I mean, Germany is in the process of. Um, assessing the asylum claims of about 850,000 people, uh, of whom the majority, not 100%, but the majority will end up winning their refugee cases and being entitled to stay. And Germany has said very clearly that it's willing to do that. Sort of ironic that give me your tired, your poor uh, resides now in Germany rather than in the United States. Yeah, I'm not sure if Mrs. Merkel actually quoted that a year ago, <laughs> but that's a f the effect of what she said. And obviously Germany is living out its own historical, uh, there's a maturing process in Germany about the role it wants to play in the world. Ironic, as some people um, have uh, commented, but I think laudable, because what Germany is saying is that they know better from their own history the importance of standing up for what are essentially Enlightenment liberal values. And liberal is not a left-right thing, it's about how one recognizes and um, uh, applauds the dignity of the individual, the freedom of the individual, the need for defense against um, the oppression of the state or of a, another citizen. And that's, those are important things to stand up for.
Well, uh, let's look at uh, your native country, uh, England, and the... UK. Uh, it's still the UK. Still right the UK, yes. Uh, still the UK, uh, as long as uh, Scotland and, and Wales stay in. But uh, you, uh, uh, at the time of Brexit, how many uh, immigrants, how many uh, refugees have they taken in? Well, the refugee numbers are pretty small in respect of Syrian refugees. Yes. The UK has agreed to take about 4,000 a year, so lower than the US. Uh, lower than Canada, which took 25,000 uh, last year. The demographics of the UK immigrant uh, population are rather different. About 3% of the population is Muslim, um, so lower than, uh, I think, the US uh, numbers. Um, the uh, travel of people who are of European origin, I think the figure was 1.5 or 2 million, and the UK population is about 65 million. So it became a big issue of what's called intra-European migration, migration within the European uh, Union. The current government has interpreted the result of the Brexit referendum as requiring the end of that open movement of labor. The intricacies of actually negotiating the exit from the European Union is, is difficult. I always say uh, populism is popular until it gets elected and then it has to deal with the reality of governing and that's the process that's going on in the UK at the moment. And uh, what are you seeing in France, this incident of the eviction of, uh, they were refugees, 7,000 refugees from the so-called Calais jungle? Well, they were, they were, their cases actually hadn't been assessed, so we don't know if they were refugees or uh, migrants. It had become not just a focus of media uh, interest. I mean, it's ironic that those 9,000 refugees and migrants should become the focus of a 65 million person problem. Um, but they, the conditions were deplorable, so on humanitarian grounds it wasn't doing anyone any good. Those people were victims, not just of, um, in the case of the refugees amongst them, of terror in their own countries. They were victims of people traffickers and the rest, and it was also very dangerous. So uh, you uh, support France's uh, uh, dismembering of the, the capital? Well, no, what, what I would say is that it's incumbent on a country like France and a country like the UK to have an orderly process for assessing asylum and refugee claims, for ensuring that those that are well-founded are properly addressed, those that aren't well-founded then that different uh, than the immigration rules apply. But in all cases, you've got to uh, uh, live up to basic humanitarian standards. And so the idea that kids are living in the midst of unspeakable conditions in the middle of Europe, and in this case in the middle of France, is not acceptable to anyone. And Either improve the conditions in the camp and make camp-based life tolerable, or provide an alternative to the camp. Now, uh, moving back across the pond to the United States, uh, you have 36% uh, of U.S. voters, according to polls, support the acceptance of more refugees from the uh, Syrian civil war. So the substantial majority of Americans uh, oppose uh, the acceptance of more refugees. And uh, the New Yorker's uh, uh, 2014 poll found that a plurality of Republican voters considered immigration to be the country's top problem. Immigration really, uh, include, including refugees. Well, immigration, I think in this case, uh, the immigration debate is, is actually raising a whole set of issues that are different from the refugee debate, not least because be of the Mexicans. And, well, not uh, least and because those. of the geography, but not only. But I mean, there are refugees from South America as well. But nonetheless, uh, the, the immigration issue is a, is a South American issue, not a Middle Eastern uh, issue. So it, does, it has, doesn't really have the same religious uh, connotations. I think that uh, the fear that exists is something that one has to take seriously, but it's incumbent on us as a refugee resettlement organization as well as an international aid organization to try and allow the voice of the refugees to come through because our experience is that when refugees move into American communities, they're met with American generosity and compassion, not with a cold shoulder. Uh, the uh UN says that it will need about uh, 3.2 billion dollars to help uh, the 13 and a half million uh, people uh, in Syria. I mean, where do they plan? That, where's that money going to come from? Well, the UN has had to reprioritize a lot of its funds to support the humanitarian effort inside Syria. I think most people would say that humanitarian aid for victims of wars is the right thing to do, not the wrong thing to do. Um, America is a contributor to that, but it's not the only contributor. And obviously, countries like Germany and Japan, the, the world's richest countries, are major UN contributors. 
Um, so I have a question for you, David Miliband, because we're coming to the end uh, right. of our program. Uh, what do you suppose is the way forward in dealing what has become an international refugee crisis? I think the refugee crisis has to be dealt with at source. So the issues of peacemaking and peacekeeping that are on the agenda at the UN are, are vital. From a humanitarian aid perspective, we've got to make a better humanitarian aid system that, that recognizes people are displaced for a long time, gives them opportunities to work and support themselves, educates their kids so they don't become a problem for the societies they reside in. And finally, we've got to show that refugee resettlement is part of the answer. A refugee resettlement in rich countries like this one. It's never going to be the majority answer for the 65 million people, but for the, for the tens of thousands or the 85,000 in the US uh, last year, it's a haven. And that's something that we should be proud of. And International Rescue Committee will be at the heart of uh, the problem working on the moment. Well, I hope the International Rescue Committee will be at the heart of the solution, not just at the heart of the problem. We've been here for 80 years since Einstein set us up. And the rescue that we are trying to offer is not just for people who are displaced by war. There's a rescue that's needed for the values that have made Western societies uh, the treasures that they are, and that's something we need to stand up for. David Miliband, part of the solution. Thank, thank you, you so much for coming nice by. Nice to meet you. And thank you for coming by. Uh, tune in next week for more conversations in the digital age. Uh, I'm Jim Zirin. All the best and take care.